I'll leave you now uh, and hand over to Hélène Papé. Right. Uh, I think we should uh, differentiate between uh, Israel and Palestine when we ask the question, how does the BDS work uh, from within? Uh, inside uh, the occupied uh, territories, it works on two levels. One is most people are trying not to use or buy uh, Israeli goods, uh, although it's very difficult. For those of you who have been to the West Bank, they would know that there are certain commodities you cannot do without, and so you have to rely on, on Israeli goods, even if you, if you don't want to. Uh, probably easier in a way in the Gaza Strip than the West Bank. Uh, inside Israel, I think it's much more of a cultural boycott, similar to the one maybe that Palestinian universities in the West Bank are, are adopting, which is uh, a very difficult task for people who are part of an academia that they ask the world to boycott. But there was a similar situation in South Africa. So uh, I think that what they rely on is the fact that boycott is institutional and not individual. So they can, in a way, talk as academics, for instance, on boycotting uh, uh, institutions, even if they work in those institutions. Uh, but I think the main role of boycott from within, if you want, is to uh, give moral support to the whole BDS movement uh, from the outside. There's not much meaning for boycott from within. The boycott is something that comes from without, not from within. But I think the moral, moral legitimization is important. Uh, and uh, for the Palestinians in the occupied territories, it's uh, an important message. But their ability to totally exercise the boycott is not easy, given the reality on the ground. It's a good question whether we can call the last wave uh, a new intifada. Uh, usually, uh, as historians, we need more time to decide whether something is a revolution, uh, an, an uprising, a revolt. Um, if you look at history, you know that it was not easy immediately to identify something. Mm. It is definitely uh, has a potential of becoming a new intifada uh, because it is uh, based on frustration, despair. Uh, it is not directed from above. It comes from below. Uh, it forces the people who are supposed to be the governments or the leaders in uh, Gaza and the West Bank to take note of this, to, to respond to this. Uh, maybe the world will also respond to this. So it is um, an intifada in the making, but I would wait before writing on it as the third intifada. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Hamas is not, uh, uh, has its own way of resisting, as we have seen in uh, last summer and in 2012 and in 20 2009. I think that this is different. This is not Hamas and this is not Fatah. This is the, the young generation which is not necessarily affiliated with any uh, political faction. So I think the implication for both the, the Fatah and the Hamas is the same. They have to take into account uh, an energy that comes from the younger generation. And probably the message is we are not happy with what you are doing so far. Whether you are the Hamas in Gaza or the PA in Ramallah. The sense is that they want something more to be done, and they show it by individual acts. Uh, there's nothing organized there uh, as yet. It can come later, but it doesn't look very organized uh, at this moment in time. Well, I think that uh, it's now even more complicated because it's confused with the question of the refugees from Syria, and because many of the Palestinians were refugees in Syria, and the Palestinian refugees in Lebanon and in Jordan are also now integrated into the big refugee problem. So I think we have to separate between two issues. One is 
the continuous struggle for the right of return of the Palestinian refugees, which the international community still refuses to recognize. And the settlement of the refugee problem in Syria and Iraq and Lebanon, which uh, will probably happen, uh, but uh, and will include some Palestinian refugees because, as you know, some of the refugee camps in Syria were destroyed. So we have people who are refugees again. Uh, but I think, uh, from a Palestinian perspective, uh, the need is to come with a clear uh, strategy of what does it mean to support the right of return in 2015, because it's not the same as the right of return in 1950. Too much has happened since then. And, uh, Yes, denial of history, mem historical memory is always a political act, uh, not only in the case of Israel and Palestine, in every uh, society that either doesn't want to remember embarrassing moments or uh, abusive moments. Uh, and uh, this is uh, always uh, the problem of people who are victims of uh, a human crimes that uh, the victimizers, those who perpetrated the crime, uh, would like the world or whoever is responsible to forget about this crime. So uh, erasing the memory is political, struggling for the memory is also a political project. Well, I think Israel is uh, one of, it's not the only, one of the states that violates systematically the international law. Uh, I think for m most Israelis, international law is something that uh, can only undermine the country's, the state's uh, security, survival and existence, so they see it as a threat. Uh, very rarely do they rely on the international law to justify what they're doing. <coughs> they usually see the international law as, uh, as something, if someone brings up the international law, they almost regard it as anti-Semitism, something that is meant to uh, undermine them, which is uh, very sad historically because international law was mainly uh, solidified after the Second World War because of what happened to the Jews in Europe. Uh, but now they don't want to see it uh, implemented in their own case. Uh, so I think that this is uh, uh, an exceptional position that Israel has with the help of the West that it can continue to violate uh, uh, the international law without any fear for uh, any kind of retribution or sanction against it. Yeah, the model which is relevant in the case of uh, war crimes of 1948 is the South African model, not the Nuremberg trials. I don't think that's it's very useful. I think the Truce and Reconciliation Committee in uh, South Africa where you you confront the crimes committed in 1948 because you want to build a different future. So for that, uh, you're not looking to punish people, but you want them to acknowledge what they did, which is a very different system. In Nuremberg, people did not want the Nazis to acknowledge what they did, they wanted to punish them. In South Africa, nobody wanted to punish the uh, people who managed the apartheid system, they wanted to them to confess, to acknowledge. And I think we we'll need a similar, maybe not exactly the same, but we we'll need a similar system in place there. At this moment in time, they will not agree to reconciliation. This is why we all support the BDS, because we think that Israel has to be pressured to agree to reconciliation. So uh, the answer is they don't, they wouldn't agree to reconciliation unless the pressure would be so strong that they will have no choice. It will not happen because they uh, voluntarily they will decide suddenly this is the right way forward. It must be a price that they have to pay. And when they would feel that the price is very high, then they will be ready for reconciliation. I think it's not a bad idea to have uh, an international presence uh, in Jerusalem for a short term. I don't know if it has to be the United Nations or uh, an agreed international force because um, uh, definitely the Palestinians in East Jerusalem uh, are in need of protection and uh, the international community so far has failed in providing this protection. So I think 
this is one possible way uh, of uh, saving them from uh, expulsion, ethnic cleansing, uh, depopulation, transfer, whatever the Israelis have in mind, especially for the eastern part of Jerusalem. So I think, yeah, it, it, it's definitely something uh, I wish the international community would have seriously considered, but I doubt very much that they would. I don't think that they will uh, tell the Israelis that they have no sovereignty uh, in Jerusalem, although the international community never recognized the official annexation of East Jerusalem to Israel. It was already done in 1967. But despite the fact that, this, that the international community does not recognize the annexation, I don't think they will pass a resolution in the United Nations that forces them to accept international uh, forces or United Nations forces on the ground. No, I, I think uh, any, any uh, security company that uh, is working closely with the occupation should be targeted by the BDS. I think it's very clear. Uh, uh, there's a lot of international communities, a uh, uh, corporation that deal with security, uh, weapons, uh, uh, digital uh, companies and so on, which uh, either provide uh, assistance or equipment or know-how, advice, uh, to the occupation. And I think uh, part of activism today is to expose exactly that kind, these kinds of connection and uh, ask the public uh, in the host countries where these companies work to uh, protest very strongly against this kind of cooperation. There's, a, uh, there's one Swedish journalist who insists that this is what Israel is doing. I, I looked uh, very uh, deeply into this question, whether the Israelis are using parts of dead Palestinian uh, uh, people who, who were killed. I couldn't find a proof of this, I must say. Um, at this moment in time, I find it difficult to believe that they would do this, but uh, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying that I really looked very deeply into this question and uh, I couldn't find any proof, but you know, some of the people who claim this are very serious people, so maybe they have a point, but uh, um, I think in the, in the short run, there's not much hope. Uh, in the short run, probably things will be worse than they are today. But I think in the long run, there are many indications that things will be different. One of them is, of course, the uh, change in public opinion in the West. Dramatic change in public opinion, even in the United States of America. And that's a very positive uh, development. Another one is the recognition of many Palestinians and peace activists in Israel that the two-state solution is not going to work. And there's a beginning of thinking of how to build the one state, which I think is a good idea. Um, but we depend on so many things which are not happening yet. One is Palestinian unity. The issue of Palestinian representation has not been solved. Uh, of course, we are affected by the uh, instability in Syria and Iraq. Uh, all these things will impact our possibilities to change the reality on the ground. But uh, there's always hope and there's a younger generation that uh, is definitely not giving up uh, on Palestine and in Palestine. And uh, uh, I'm sure as an historian that Palestine will be liberated one day. I don't know how long it will take, but I'm sure it will, it will be. People will be emancipated and uh, hopefully uh, Jews and Palestinians will live uh, peacefully together. But it's a long, a very long journey. I mean, people need to be very patient. Uh, it's not going to happen uh, soon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We hope for peace. Yeah. yeah? Thanks very much. Okay, thank, thank, you. Very much. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.